so Midsummer is directed by Ari Aster and it's a follow up to the very impressive Hereditary that was released last year. Um, looking back at my notes for Hereditary actually I put it in my top 10 list of last year. I also remember distinctly that the audience I was watching it with in the Odeon Cinema in Wimbledon I believe was split down the middle 50-50 as many people were laughing quite hardly at it actually uh, and the, the other half of the crowd they were horrified and I do believe that's exactly how Midsummer will play to big audiences as well I wouldn't be surprised if there was a lot of laughter but for me like Hereditary this was pure terror and dread while watching this movie I can't say I fully relate to the experience of laughing at some of the more bizarre things that happen in each film and specifically for this review Midsummer, but maybe it stems from being unable to immerse yourself fully in the credibility of the unbelievable but I would argue that it's the pure straightness in which the unusualness is played in Midsummer. That makes it all the more chilling. Which I will get to. Now the opening segments of this movie. Craft the relationship dynamics. Between the central couple in this movie. Danny played by the wonderful actress Florence Pugh. Pugh? Pug? I don't know. I don't do my research properly. Uh, but I liked her a lot in movies like Lady Macbeth. And Fighting With My Family. An A-list actor really she's going to become. Who I can't wait to see more of. And her boyfriend in this. Is a guy named Christian. Played by Jack Renner. Now people have described this movie. As a movie about their central relationship. And it's ultimate breaking down. I'm not saying it's not about that. But for me. What the dynamic of the couple does. Which is established early on is it actually maps their trajectory and it rationalises their actions and almost explains their motivations in a movie that as we get deep into this depicts their actions as anything but rational. And I also have a feeling actually, depending on the viewer's sex, people will probably have wildly different reactions to each member of the couple it's maybe a general statement but allow me to get in trouble for a minute well trouble in 2019's very low standards for getting in trouble it has to be said but I do believe men and women will have a different reaction not to say on whose side of the couple they're on because it's not about sides but let's say more recognise different characteristics and maybe be more aggravated by one member of this couple more than the other depending on the sex that is watching it in my opinion. It, It was interesting to me actually I purposefully listened to a few women film critics on this film as I had a big feeling that they would have a stronger hatred for Jack Renner's character than I did as I kind of recognised maybe his attitude and understood it more than a woman might and vice versa I'm sure lots of women probably will identify more with Florence Pugh's character as well that's why different voices are great but their dynamic is very interesting not just for dramatic tension as we have this slowly simmering already built in personality incompatibilities but also a very well established explanation if you want to call it that for the role each character takes as perhaps the more abstract observations of the film we get later and it gets pretty bizarre but yeah Jack Rayner's character and even his persona in other movies he he just oozes d4 douchery and i guess for people who don't know 
what D4 douchery is, I can kind of best describe it as maybe like if a hipster went to Eton College in England. I don't know. But but Jack Rayner isn't a bad guy in this by any means, but he's one of these passive, maybe always in his own head, a little self, self-centered and very directionless. He has a look of a guy in this that I recognise well. And perhaps this is where the different interpretation of the sexes will come into this. But he has the look of a guy that is drained from his girlfriend's constant mini crises over the course of his three year relationship. Now I'm not saying what Florence Pugh's character goes through isn't genuine or really not a problem for her at all in this movie but what I am saying is that he probably viewed these problems as general full-on emotional dump loads of non-events that he didn't perhaps think were things to really get anxious over and the fact that he was constantly getting called about all these things probably withered him down and it's interesting actually as well the psychology in my limited experience in how women and men deal with anxiety women in my experience often want to unload their anxiety to feel better whereas I don't know I can only speak for myself and for my circle of male friends we kind of just want to move on from these events (laughs) as quickly as possible now i'm not conflating that with the very serious events that take place in the beginning of this film i'm just talking very generally here but obviously in the film's opening moments it does become something that materializes into something serious but but he definitely has the look of a man who is drained by his girlfriend's over-dependence on him over a three-year relationship and is unhappy. But because of his kind of directionless, maybe cowardly passive character, he would rather stay in that situation that he is unhappy with than maybe roll the dice and see what's next. Florence Pugh's character, for her part, is very dependent on him. He is her rock to unload all her stress in her life and maybe her own isolation and lack of feeling of belonging. She too, for her part, is clinging to this guy she knows (laughs) carries himself like he has one foot in the door and one foot out the door in this relationship. She already knows that but is so desperate to be loved and to be held and feel a sense of family especially after the events that transpire early in this film that I'm talking around, that she is willing to set such a low bar for her needs in this D4 douchebag, as I've mentioned. Now, the reason why you have spent so long setting up this relationship is just how it feeds so well into every beat of the film almost, in looks, in just reactions to the more quieter scenes early on. It really grips you almost in a more highbrow reality TV way in the way relationships are heightened in in, in these extreme and unusual conditions. So after all that uh, earlier moments in which the film spends time to set up that dynamic, the couple and a few more college friends travel to Sweden to visit a rural place to observe this festival. Will Pooter also tags along as one of the friends and he's another actor I can't get enough of. Incidentally, Jack Rayner can't either. I think it's their third film starring with each other after Detroit and a decent Irish movie called Glassland, which actually had Tony Collette in it, who was in Hereditary. But anyway... Now, upon their arrival in Sweden, the movie does this brilliant thing that Ari Aster has managed to get right twice now in Hereditary as well and now Midsummer, And that is this kind of adjacent beat sheet that manages to play classic horror movie tropes at the same time as finely tuned art house cinema and make it work. And believe me, 
I'm somebody that hates the tendency of art house cinema to almost asphyxiate the entertainment and fun factor out of its genre in place of something else. I, I think movies like The Witch, You Were Never Really Here by Lynn Ramsey are guilty of that. But that's only my opinion. I've been on both sides of the cinema, so to speak, when it comes to reactions to that type of feeling I can get when leaving the cinema after seeing a movie like that. I can be bewildered or I can be shouting from the hills of how good it is. So it just depends really on... I guess different people's opinions of the different movies. But yeah. Ari Aster manages to have his cake and eat it for a long time. His beats feel so structured in a genre. Even if they are hard to detect sometimes amongst the chaos and the confusion. I think there is enough straightforward narrative at the heart of his movies. Amongst the cloud of his visuals and his abstractions. That his movies managed to grip me in the exact same way that more trashy horror can. He's such a, a great director anyway. And he knows when to use or deal his visual hand. Always at the service of his film. Which I appreciate. For instance there was one scene when they are on their way to this rural festival as I mentioned. And he just decides to shoot the road like it's upside down now sometimes nicholas wind and reffin might just throw in these type of things that are almost counterproductive to the narrative that is being told and interferes with the flow i often find but everything ari aster throws in seems to completely flow with the rhythm of his story and not interfere with it at all so and in a way that I'm far from put out by it. In fact it adds to the vibe. And the feeling of uneasiness. Perfectly in this movie. In fact any art house flourish in this movie. It can be argued. Is totally in service of the movie. Which I really appreciated. The movie as I mentioned. Hits many of the familiar. Beats of these kind of. Horror movies. Annoying outsiders ignorant americans intruding on a town or culture they are unfamiliar with and totally being rude and ignorant and slowly uncovering the dark secrets of a place it follows that kind of trajectory but with one vital difference that just takes this movie to a different level altogether for me you know in movies when you have these people showing up in an area it's usually like hillbilly land where you might get some repulsive inbred looking gas attendant that always seems unhinged and repulsive. So so that's already <laughs> a red flag that this guy will be raping you with his brother wearing a pig mask later on. <laughs> or even in cult movies there is always this kind of inherent fucked upness of the society that is clear for all to see. Well... This society in Midsummer, they come across, in a way, it's just played completely straight. No matter what happens and how crazy and how out there it becomes. They're just so committed to the joy to what they are doing in everything that they act out. That it's almost the sheer good natured joy that they are getting from all this that is most sinister of all. It, it taps into... That kind of euphoria and genuine joy people get from organised religion. Despite, in my opinion, if you start to delve into the rituals of Christianity or Islam or Scientology. It just seems to me, anyway, to be a bit batshit crazy. But in these more, shall I say, mainstream religions, I can only really speak with an authority about Christianity, to be honest, anyway, having been raised in that environment. But the ceremonial practices of these kind of religions anchor so many people and give them so much joy and grounding. Well, the film manages to capture that experience for the community in Midsummer. So when all these graphic and quite nasty things start to happen, we never get the feeling that the masks of this community are slipping or the masks are slipping of this seemingly utopia society that we knew there was something dark 
lurking underneath that we get in these type of genre movies generally because the horror in this movie if you want to call it that is played out as genuine affection and conviction by the community and it's displayed so openly that it never feels like a dark underbelly in the traditional sense even their college friend actually who invites them to Sweden in the first place his persona doesn't change he still almost feels like the same exact cool dude he always was. It's just a such a refreshing take, but deeply, deeply unnerving. Obviously, we ourselves are horrified, as we can easily identify with the outsider's <laughs> point of view in this place, obviously. Now, there is a point in this movie where the art house stream diverges from... The conventional horror beat sheet, if you want to call it that. And I kind of felt like I wish it continued down the path of the familiar beat sheet. And give me the hit of genre cinema that I was getting through this movie in in a very unique way. I, I can't get into too much what I mean without spoilers. But I needed to get a few more classic scenes and tropes from this type of horror movie that I didn't get it kind of stops following the traditional route by the end of the second act and committed fully into the realm of artistic abstract interpretation right up until the final shot now I didn't have a problem with this even though I think I would have liked to get my hit of the genre's third act we normally get I guess there wouldn't be much fun in that for some as we would get the same third act we normally do. But another reason why I was fine with the divergence as well was I, I think the film does such a good job of establishing the need for belonging and family of Danny and her kind of unhealthy dependence on the D4 douche almost crippling her. And... All this kind of accumulates in a very disturbing yet believable way in which she, she purges her emotions and her grief in this way that kind of feeds into that dynamic between male and female I was talking about in a way that women like to unburden their emotions anyway which is different in my experience to how men deal with emotion and as I mentioned, the fact that we establish Christian's passive, directionless nature, it kind of, in a way, excused a lot of the typical doom moves that a character like him would traditionally make in a horror movie. It, it rationalised it based on his character. It just made perfect sense to me the roles and actions that these characters undertook in the third act, in what was probably, no doubt, a very divisive final act of this movie and final scene even but it just made total sense to me and I think this film made me fall back in love with cinema again actually and as of now I think it is my favourite film of the year so far so go see it preferably with a smaller audience